The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk um, about what exactly bilingualism does to your brain. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, like what the brain parts are and all of that. Um, it's just meant as a like a general introduction. And um, most of you are probably convinced that um, learning another language is a great thing. Um, but some of you might have heard people say that it's confusing for children to learn a second language um, or that it's just not a useful thing to do. And um, research has shown that um, not all of this is completely untrue, um, but there are also like real cognitive advantages to bilingualism. Um, so I'll address both of these sides and try to um, stay neutral. <laughs> and um, I'm going to use results of um, behavioral studies as well as neuroimaging research. And um, on a side note, of course, um, talking about multilingualism um, might have been a bit more interesting to some of you. But the reason that I'm not going to do that is, well, there's not that much research on it. Um, we could try and change that, of course. At first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brain and what it does and what it's got to do with language. And um, in the front, which is here, that front, um, you've got um, the executive functions. Um, those manage our um, cognitive abilities like um, planning, working memory, switching attention, and inhibition. And those will be important a bit later on. Um, around the areas of um, number two and four, um, you've got um, two areas that are responsible for language comprehension and region three is mostly used for language production. So just to give a general idea of the places. <laughs> and now it's a bit more technical. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about um, methods um, and neuro neuroimaging and yeah, how we can find out about language in the brain and what the problems are with this. Um, and yeah, this might show that, um, yeah, we don't have that many results yet. We don't know everything. And yeah, it's interesting to see how this develops. And um, there are three methods that are mostly used for language studies. And you might have heard of um, fMRI and EEG. Um, functional magnetic resonance imaging is um, that's where um, people are put in some kind of tube and um, it's really noisy and you're not allowed to move like you've got to stay really still and the problem with this is that you can't um, look at children's learning for example because it's hard to keep them still and it would be kind of um, a bit unethical to put them in this tube but you know just it's really noisy and um, some people get claustrophobia from that, and uh, the same thing um, happens with older people when they can't keep still for a long time. And you also can't look at speech production. So if you start talking, that's totally gonna screw up the measurements. And um, yeah, so uh, still, it's um, often done to map certain brain areas. Um, because it's got good spatial resolution and yeah it doesn't have good temporal resolution also so you even get um, problems with processes that are like faster than um, five seconds and many processes are um, yeah the next one is EEG um, electroencephalography <laughs> and um, there you put lots of electrodes on a person's head and that's also done often with children and yeah it's not that bad you just get those like things on your head and um, yeah it's not that precise spatially uh, because you've only got those electrodes and only those points you can measure and um, yeah you can move around with it and it's really fast and yeah it measures activity within milliseconds so it's good for language because that happens kind of fast in the brain. And 
yeah, so it's, it's quite a good tool. And EEG and FNRS, they can be used in combination. And FNRS, uh, you probably haven't heard of, at least I hadn't <laughs> before I started my master's thesis on it. Um, it's easy to transport, you can move around with it, and um, it's also placed on the head. And it can only measure like four centimeters inside the brain, like under the skull. And yeah, it can be problematic, but language usually takes place on the outer parts. Um, so it's good for that. And it doesn't have um, good spatial resolution, but you can put those um, optodes that measure. Um, you can put them in areas that you're interested in. So yeah, that's not too much of a problem. And um, I think we're going to hear much more in future um, about FNIRS because it's still quite new. And yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, maybe more studies with children and elderly people. Um, okay. Um, well, concerning general mental abilities, um, it's been shown that bilingual children, as well as adults, have a lower vocabulary in each of their languages than monolinguals in their community. Uh, but if you look at this in a more differentiated way, um, there's been, for example, a study um, that looked at um, vocabulary sizes uh, in children. And they showed that um, the children had um, less um, home vocabulary in English if they only studied English at school. Uh, so that's kind of logical that you don't have that much home vocabulary then, because um, yeah, you don't speak it at home. So I think it's also a matter of time and input. And so yeah, I think it's quite easy to explain that problem. And there's also a general difference between monolinguals and bilinguals um, concerning word retrieval. Um, this means, for example, that um, if people give you the task, um, tell me what's on this picture, um, then bilinguals tend to take a bit longer. And that is due to um, the thing that in our brains, we tend to activate both of our languages at the same time. And it seems that this kind of always happens, even if we don't notice it. And yeah, so it takes us a bit longer naturally to decide, OK, which language do I use now? And yeah, which one is the other person not going to understand? And yeah, so I think it's also quite easy to explain that. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, bilinguals do have an overall higher performance in the executive functions that I mentioned before. And maybe those functions didn't sound like they're directly related to language. Um, but for bilingualism, they're actually very important. And we train them on a daily basis here. Um, it's, for example, the part of switching attention. Like, we have to switch languages and well, if we train that very often, then naturally we get better at it. And yeah, that's kind of an advantage that we have. And yeah, it also helps us um, train our inhibition abilities because we always have to inhibit that one language. Yeah, no, the way we think um, might be a bit different from monolinguals. And for bilinguals, it seems to be more effortful to process language. And we're shown to have more activation, well, activation in many language areas of the brain. Um, monolinguals, they have a tendency to only use the left hemisphere. Um, we also use the right hemisphere quite a lot, and also more areas in the left one. So uh, the brain is just more active when we process language. and. Yeah, this can be seen as a problem, that um, it's more effortful. But on the other hand, um, yeah, we activate more brain areas, so uh, it's a good training and can be a good thing. And some quite recent results um, were about 
how speakers of different languages um, think and how this affects bilinguals. And the researchers showed participants short video clips. And there was, for example, um, a woman walking towards a car or um, a man cycling to the supermarket. And um, yeah, so there was a, the supermarket was, it was possible to see the supermarket and that. Um, but um, the English speakers usually said things like a woman is walking or a man is cycling. So they focus more on the acting. And uh, when they asked Germans to do that, then um, they said um, things like eine Frau läuft zu einem Auto, like uh, a woman uh, is walking towards a car. So it was more goal focused. And yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, then they tested this with English-German bilinguals in the UK and they asked them to speak German and they replied in the typically English way like um, a man is walking, for example, um, in German, of course. And um, the same thing happened with um, bilinguals in Germany. So it was always typical to the country they were um, asked to do that in. Um, but then they tried something else. Um, they made one group um, focus on, for example, English by letting them repeat some numbers in English. And they had to reply in German, but they replied in the English typical way. So um, they said things like, um, I'm walking towards, uh, not towards a car, but just leave that out. And uh, the same thing happened with the English people. And even um, when they changed the language of focus, like from German to English, they had to suddenly repeat like German numbers instead of English ones. Um, that also happened. So the focus, it changed right along with it. Yeah, so um, it might change a bit the way we think, um, even if we don't notice. And um, something that I also thought was quite interesting um, is when they had to judge economical risks in a game, bilinguals um, had to consider their, language, uh, their um, options in a second language, and they made the most economically useful decisions. And maybe it was because they considered their actions more thoroughly, you know, and it's always more difficult to think about things in your second language. And it was only one study, but it might give an idea that, well, maybe next time um, you think about investing money, you could think about it in your second language, and maybe you're going to get better results from that. OK, now um, a more practical part, um, childhood, which is quite controversial, do I raise my children bilingually or monolingually? So I'm going to try to stay neutral on that. But yeah, um, first of all, they do show all the advantages and disadvantages that adults show that I already mentioned. Um, but there are also some results that are more specific to children. And yeah, um, the thing is that they do mix their languages quite frequently. Um, as adults, we do that too, of course, but not so often. I think because our inhibition ability has been trained enough. And actually, this doesn't really have to be a bad thing. Um, I think that instead, if you're able to entirely switch the language in the middle of a sentence, and it still makes sense, then yeah, that's good. It shows that you know the grammar and the words of both languages really well. And yeah, exercising that inhibition is going to make them much better at it later. So it's an exercise and it takes them more effort, but yeah, later on they get the advantages from that. And also, um, monolingual infants, they start to lose their ability to distinguish between um, phonemes of other languages at like 10 months old. When they're 10 months old, they already lose this ability. And if you learn a second language before that, or you get lots of input from that, um, 
then you don't lose this ability at all. So you just keep it and it stays there. And um, this is even like if they don't, uh, they haven't heard of German, for example, and um, speak maybe like, I don't know, English and French or something. Um, and they are shown like the difference between U and U in German, for example. Mm -hmm. They could still differentiate between those two sounds, but other infants weren't able to do that. So I think that's kind of a real advantage that you can still distinguish between those sounds. Um, of course, um, we can learn to distinguish that later, but it takes a lot of effort and yeah, we really have to think about that. Like U and U, it's I think a really difficult thing for many people. Yeah, um, some researchers also looked at um, children who were eight months old and they made them watch silent videos of speakers of languages that they hadn't heard before. And they're the bilingually raised infants. They realized when the language was changed, like from Spanish to French, for example. And it was silent, so they, they couldn't even hear what the people were saying, just from the movement of the mouth. And the monolingual children, they weren't able to do that. So, yeah, at eight months, so that's like really early. And I mean, you can't say that it's genetically influenced, so it's got to happen, like, I don't know, when you're a few months old, and goes away really fast. Um, there have been a few studies looking at um, early bilinguals versus late bilinguals, and late in this case means that you learned your language after the age of 10. So, well, not really late for us, but um, they say that. And um, they were trying to find out if um, it would make a difference if they spoke um, really related languages like um, English and French, as opposed to English and Chinese, which are not related. And yeah, but they found that it didn't make a difference if the language was closely related or not at all. So yeah, <laughs> maybe it's, um, it's still uh, got the same usefulness to study French if you're an English speaker, like Chinese. So it doesn't seem to give an advantage. It's still just one study, so not really representative. Excuse me, could, could I ask you a question concerning mm -hmm. this point? Is there anything um, you could say about dialects? I mean, not languages, but dialects? Like, I, I come from a German-speaking mm -hmm. uh, environment, but I'm from Austria, so there's a lot of difference between standard yeah. written language and dialect. So is, is that um, the thing is, that hasn't really been done yet. I know like that one guy in Scotland is working on that now, but otherwise, I've, like, I think it hasn't really been done yet. At least I haven't found it, and yeah, I would guess that it's like a continuum. But a continuum, you can't really find out about that in a study because you have to have like significant differences in that. So I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your discussion about up to ten months is probably based on the Christian Cole study at the uh, University of Washington, and. She tries to tie it to critical period, uh, critical period hypothesis. Mm -hmm. It's without context and it's totally misleading. Okay. You brought up that it can be learned later, but it has not. Nothing is lost. Nothing is. Yeah, lost. yeah. <laughs> That's using those words. I think is deceptive. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. A few very like, rare studies um, have looked at um, elderly people and they have shown that um, speaking a second language, um, well, it generally means that your cognitive abilities stay intact for a bit longer than for monolinguals, but um, this could be also due to, um, yeah, um, if you just do any cognitive exercise. So it's not really sure, like, is it necessarily language that's causing it or could you just learn like um, another instrument and improve that? Um, but some looked at um, hospital records of dementia patients, 
and they matched patients on age and background and so that this couldn't influence it, the results. And they came to the result that um, bilinguals were diagnosed like three to five years later than monolinguals. Um, I mean, they didn't really do like a long-term study on that, which would be really interesting, but well, I think it's at least it's an indicator. So yeah, they show symptoms later. Yeah, um, further research, um, those are like the questions that mm, would be interesting to look at now. And overall, there seems to be a tendency that um, several factors contribute um, to the cognitive advantage. And that's, for example, when we start learning the second language and how often we use the language and the overall level that we have in these languages. and. Well, it hasn't really been researched yet, but I would, if I had to guess, I would say that um, all these factors play together. So yeah, it's not like too late if you haven't learned a, a second language um, by the age of 10 months, then you're still able to do that, obviously. And yeah, the problem with almost all these studies is um, that they didn't really look at um, differences between learning a second language and like learning an instrument. So. Yeah, we don't know that. Um, it's like a complex learning thing, and there are lots of those too. So, yeah, and also not many studies have been done that um, looked at um, bilingualism versus multilingualism. I think that's um, um, still going to be done. <laughs> and the problem I think with this is that. Um, most of the neuroimaging takes place in, for example, Europe and Northern America, because there you've got the tools and all of that. And in those areas, it's usually um, it's a motivational thing. If you become multilingual, then you have to have a lot of mot motivation, and you might have a different like background, socioeconomically, or things like that. So that would really influence the results. So it's not really, mm, it, it's interesting to look at here, but it would be more interesting if you could um, take those um, gadgets to um, areas, for example, the Amazon region where people speak like several languages just normally and it's not like a special thing. And yeah, another thing would be interesting um, is to look at different levels of bilingualism and this also really hasn't been done that much and in most studies it doesn't even say anything about the language level um, of the participants so um, everyone's got their own definition of bilingualism like am I bilingual if I speak um, at a level of A2 or only if I speak it like at the C2 level so everyone can interpret it their way and yeah, researchers sometimes don't even mention that point in their studies. And yeah, um, if I had to guess, then I'd say it's probably more beneficial to have a higher level in the second language. Um, and well, I also think that multilingualism has probably higher advantages <laughs> than being bilingual. And probably it can be a lot of fun. And yeah, I'm not just saying this because everyone probably thinks the same thing here. So, yeah, um, that's those are the references. In case anyone's interested, I can send them to you. Yeah. Twenty more minutes for questions. Okay, I have a question. So, it was already asked about dialects, but um, maybe not dialect, but very close related languages, for example, like Netherlands or English or Russian and Belarusian, mm -hmm. do you have the same bilingual effects or has it to be a far related language from different families at least? <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think it's also, it, it hasn't really been done yet. I think maybe it's due that to, well, if you do research, you want to get some results because otherwise you won't get paid <laughs> and you can't publish it. Well, just as a guess, and that's why maybe people don't look at closely related ones. 
So I think, yeah, as I said, maybe it's a continuum and you can't really put a significant difference to that. Um, yeah, it really hasn't been known yet that much. Yeah. Uh, you say that they don't acknowledge the level of linguistic attainment among bilinguals in the study, so they don't mention it. So I was wondering if uh, there is any research indicating what happens when a person in the brain, when somebody doesn't recognize a word, if, if, if your brain does something with that, with that word, if there's something activated somewhere saying, oh, I don't understand that, or, or if it's noticeable. Mm, yeah, I would have to guess on that, because um, I haven't read any studies on that. If anyone knows, then please <laughs> feel free to tell me. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I think that you would activate um, your languages that you, you already know and try to relate it to some of that. And yeah, that's what I would think happens, that you activate your language areas and uh, try to find out about that. You were saying that the bilinguals' brains are more active, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Do you know of any studies um, looking at the intelligence level of bilinguals? <laughs> um, not really, no. And um, I think, well, I haven't, no, I haven't really found any studies that related to that. I think it, yeah, it might be a bit controversial, but I guess if you tested them, like, on intelligence factors like executive function, for example, like when they have to use their abilities to plan, for example, or um, just general language abilities, I think they would score higher. But yeah, I think no one's really looked at the IQ specifically or something. Uh, as a, if I understood it correctly, what the um, sort of basis of of uh, all of the this information is for children who were bilingual from uh, before ten months is is that right? Yes. So I'm just wondering if and if there's any crossover from any of this bet with people who learn languages at different stages. You know, if you've learned it uh, at when at one year old or but not prior or even older five year. I mean, is there any kind of um, Ch any, any studies or that, that talk about changes in the brain because I know the brain continues to develop anyway through yeah. childhood so I'm just wondering if, if your thoughts on, on that um, well as you said it develops on and on um, until we're I think at least like 25 even and for example like the planning ability develops um, until like even 25 at least I read that somewhere <laughs> and um, yeah, as I said, it, it's probably um, like the earlier the better, um, and yeah, it's kind of this uh, hypothesis that there's a, like a critical period, but for that you would have to test really a lot of levels, you know, like um, maybe like two months, four months, six months, eight months, and then you would have to see, okay, when there might be some kind of cut there, and yeah, would be interesting to look at. Do you serious, seriously yourself believe oh, earlier is better? Um, but I think it's one of the, the factors. So you believe there is such a thing as a critical period of hypothesis? Well, I think there's a critical period in the sense that if you haven't learned language before at all, um, then yeah, you lose that ability. Language, the first language. Yeah. yeah. But with a second language, of course not. I mean, we're all proof that <laughs> it's not the case that we can become bilingual much later, too. Well, the problem with, this, with a lot of these studies is that the, the monolingual English speakers yeah. are, are giving the, uh, are, um, interpreting the observations. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a really, like, maybe also like a cultural thing or, I don't know, no, it's an area thing. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as um, intelligence goes, I mean, I don't know if this is entirely related, but people with cognitive difficulties can be bilingual or multilingual. I've met yeah. people in Canada who are bilingual in French. I have a family member who worked in a facility for people who needed uh, assisted living. 
um, because they had cognitive difficulties, and to the extent of their cognitive ability, they were bilingual in French yeah. and English. So to whatever level they could speak English, they could speak French because they came from an area that happened to be very bilingual. Yeah. I know that's just an anecdotal observation. Yeah, I think that it depends on which brain areas have the problems. Yeah. And, well, if, if language areas don't have a problem, then, okay, yeah, you can say the same things in many languages. About age limits, I have uh, seen an Italian study where the uh, test subjects were translators and uh, interpreters from uh, the community in uh, Brussels. That is creme de la creme of those people who have learned languages. And that uh, was clear, as uh, from my memory, that the amplitude, but not distribution, of the brain activity was very different between people who have learned languages before five years and or later. What have you, have you got anything about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There, there are a number of studies that, that say that, but then there are studies that came afterwards that said, no, the fact is, how well do you speak the language? So if your proficiency in the language is extremely high or equal, then the areas of the brain activated will be the same for your first language. So it's a matter of uh, achievement and not time. Okay, so there's no support at all for a critical period hypothesis. None. Zero. Zero. <laughs> that depends on the level of the language. You can look at this. I can show you the studies later if you like. <coughs> Could I just uh, say a little thing from personal experience? I was shortly after birth. I had frontal lobe brain damage. I also have Asperger's, which is an artistic spectrum, which is it's a pre-birth, you know, it's um, up until 21 I was completely monolingual and my English was very, very poor as well. I had poor communication skills. Well, I found, first of all, becoming fluent, completely fluent in Gaelic from the age of 21. It took me four years. I've gone on to, well, I've studied 17 languages, but I only speak five. So I found that that has really helped me with my English, which had, you know, even though it was, you know, my first language, um, parts of speech and uh, just general communication was uh, really poor. What I found is that my additional languages have helped to uh, develop my English as well. So it's, you know, language in general, um, in addition to, uh, you know, languages, you know, that has helped to develop um, you know, from what I've observed of myself. That was great. Um, yeah, so when you looked at the effects of low vocab and retrie word retrieval, how significant is that? Is it like a 1% or 5 or 10% lower no. vocab or slower speed? And also, for every additional language that you are, uh, you know, multilingual in, do you lose an extra percentage of vocab from, or or does it kind of tail off and then you can kind of add more and more with no um, effects? Well, I think you can always add more and more, but it's like you've got constraints like time, and you've got constraints like, for example, if you're a child and you go to school, you speak English there, but at home you speak Vietnamese or something, then your school vocabulary in Vietnamese is not going to be high, and yeah, I think it's just, uh, that's just like a practical constraint. What do you use your time for, your resources, and yeah, what do you make of it? And um, I think that overall it showed that, um, well, you might not have such a high vocabulary in um, each of the languages as monolinguals, but like overall you certainly have higher amount of vocabulary if you take those two languages together, for example. Um, yeah. So you were referencing the children under 10 months of age. That was just specifically about their ability to immediately recognize the difference between a, a sound. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. about the ability to acquire it over time. It wasn't suggesting, mm -hmm. because what I understood is that those children could readily identify it the difference 
but not that somebody couldn't learn that. I didn't uh, interpret it that way. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay, exactly. I just looked at, um, well, children at that age and, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I think it was someone in front who asked this question. It was about where um, where a language actually is stored and um, how it, how uh, which part of the brain are involved in learning. And I've recently been reading about this, and I think it was amygdala, which is also involved in emotion. Which so if a word triggers an emotional uh, response inside of you, your uh, ability to remember it is like. Uh, the chances, the probability of you remembering this word is higher, and also the hippocampus. And I also was reading on them when you were learning something. Oh, you also mentioned that there was a study that uh, with the transcranial magnetic stimulation, I think it was, and it only measures the four centimeters inside the brain, and that's because when you are learning a language, the uh, uh, you have to uh, first acquire it, then uh, your uh, brain starts encoding it, then consolidation, and then you have to be able to retrieve it and use it in, I don't know, a conversation or whatever. And in order for you to be able to use the language, it has to be stored in the neocortex and stuff like that. So basically, um, the part of uh, the brain that you're using when you're uh, studying a language, uh, like the amygdala, when you're... Um, like yesterday I heard somebody speaking about she was an interpreter and one time she uh, encountered a word she didn't know so she was like freaking out and that's what I mean when you're using the amygdala then because you're like oh my god what is this and she said I'm never going to forget this word that's why the emotional charge that's she's never going to forget that word because she was freaking out so much so those are the parts that are involved in uh, when you're learning a, a language oh, well I wouldn't recommend fear as a like motivator, <laughs> but like emotion, I, as you said, it's I think really good. Like always good to have to use those connections in the brain and to make them, you know, to make them between areas of your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. No more questions. Oh, I just wanted to say, like I think some of these questions are are being triggered by this, but we have to be careful in how we interpret these kinds of studies because yeah. I mean as you mentioned some of these factors like you know some of these studies have small numbers of people or mm -hmm. you know already even when you start looking at these you know monolingual versus bilingual already before you even look at them they, there are maybe some factors that distinguish them like their socio yeah. socioeconomic status or other things um, so and then you know we have to look at exactly what is the study looking at like the the I think the 10 month um, study uh, was looking only at yeah exactly if you just show them these phonemes yeah. once can they distinguish them immediately mm -hmm. and it didn't look at whether they can learn that you know after yeah, two or three yeah. tries so um, you know I think we have to be careful about setting specific percentages or cutoffs uh, yeah of course uh, it for, yeah, I mean yeah it's really that. difficult like uh, probably as all areas of research but with bilingualism yeah we just don't have that much and yeah just need to do more research and more specific and um, yeah look at um, the confounds more and we have no more questions okay so I would like to ah there was one uh, hi you said that uh, judging risk is more successful in second language and I'd like to hear more about that, uh, especially what kind of risk are you speaking about? Because you mentioned investing money. I'd like to know if it's something like risk, like buying a house, or if it's like crossing the street. Because, uh. <laughs> because so far uh, I've noticed that uh, this on, um, on myself, I noticed this kind of difference, especially in crossing the street. I noticed that I might act different ri differently according to the language <coughs> I think of, I think in. But uh, so far, I thought it had to do with cultural ident identification, because people don't cross the street the same way in different countries. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm very interested in, in hearing more about this. Um, well, I think they specifically looked at um, U.S. students who had studied Spanish, but I think only in the U.S. Um, so I don't think it's 
this specifically was due to culture. Of course, that influences your thinking. Like if you lived in two different countries, then um, yeah, you might cross the street in a different way. Like you might start just walking and hope that no <laughs> one runs you over, or um, exactly. look like like right yeah. there, like <laughs> and yeah. So um, I think that this is just a factor of um, you know I'm thinking about what I'm going to do more. And if I do that in a second language, then, like for example, um, if I have a game and I have to, like, react to something, I have to say, okay, I'm gonna um, invest, I don't know, ten dollars <coughs> in this or in that. Then, well, you think about it more if you use your second language. Just, um, I think they made them read the instructions. Um, also in uh, Spanish, so that um, could definitely have influenced that too, because if also if you get the instructions in another language, then um, yeah, perception, and it takes you longer to process that, and you need to think about it, yeah. <coughs> Basically, I think they were stimulated by the idea of fast thinking slow thinking that Kahneman proposes. And so they're trying to test it. And so the fast thinking is just in acting immediately. Okay, our first reaction, the gut reaction. And as you said, the think longer about it when you're using a second language. Or So it, it just activates more reflection. And yeah, that's yeah. the idea that there's, uh, you become more risk averse in that sense. Yeah. yeah. The last question. Uh, I've also been reading on cortical plasticity, and um, uh, up until recently, they said there was no uh, ability that there all the people were not able to form new um, mm -hmm. neurons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But there was a theory that um, either there, when you're older, there is an unveiling of weak uh, connections between the synapses, so that uh, those connections become stronger, or yeah. Are you more um, um, inclined to think that there isn't a, that all the people are able to form new neurons? So um, I was wondering what kind of. Uh, I think I read probably the same thing uh, about that. Um, I don't exactly remember it, but um, yeah, I think. Well, we have to do studies. I I just I don't know because I haven't really done research um, specifically on that and. Um, yeah, I think if that study says so that we can build more new neurons, then okay, um, should do more studies on that. But I I do think that um, like also for uh, younger adults, it's been shown that um, the connections um, get stronger. The connections that you use on a, like a daily basis, those get stronger, and the other ones they kind of go away, um, or become more like silent, for example. Uh, what I've also been noticed, I, I also noticed by, um, I, um, while starting a new language, the knowledge of my own language, uh, my native tongue is, it's going down and down and down, and actually, the most basic words, I, I cannot even remember whether they are supposed to stick together or not, so, I'm really not sure, I, I was hoping that you, uh, maybe you had a strong opinion on whether it's, the unveiling of weak connections or maybe forming formation of new ones, but new neurons. But mm -hmm. You don't have a strong inclination towards one of the either. Or um, concerning neurons uh, specifically, I don't because I haven't read much on that. And um, yeah, um, I think that um, basically you do um, have still have these like time constraints and the input you get. Like if you focus more on a second language, for example, you live in another country, you don't speak your own language anymore, then of course the things you don't use, they um, you lose, you lose them. Um, you have the same thing. Okay, like I've studied Russian, and I've started it many times, but always tend to forget again and again. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you.